Helena Leet Pellegrini comes from Milford, Massachusetts, and she is a psychologist, a creative expression coach, and a storyteller. And Helena, when she tells stories, uh, has been described as sharing her personal journey through many of life's triumphs and trials. And she has performed her stories in different ways, uh, in, uh, as features and also as one woman shows. She has been to Boulder, Colorado, uh, sharing her stories at the Col Boulder, Colorado Fringe Festival, at Story Space, and Passim in Cambridge, an Amazing Things Art Center as well. When I asked Helena for sharing one or two of her most memorable moments, she said, whenever I get to share with others, not only fun, the ha-has of life, but the moments when we awaken to life, those ahas. And when I asked her how, if she found some way that storytelling um, is related to her work in uh, psychotherapy, uh, in being a creativity coach, she responded, story has the healing power to connect us all. When we share stories, we get to see that even though our individual tales differ, we are all part of that one big story, a story filled with ups and downs. It's called Human Beings Being Human. And with that, I would like to uh, introduce to you Helena Leet Pellegrini. Please give her a warm morning welcome. A stroll down memory lane. It's 1954, Radcliffe College, my freshman year. It was a Saturday afternoon, the day of the first home Harvard football game. I was walking down the stairs of my dormitory when Briggsy, the girl on duty at the front desk, called out, Helena, these two boys just came in. They're thirsty. Would you get them something to drink? Of course, I said. A tall boy and a not-so-tall boy followed me into the dorm kitchen where I gave them each a glass of water. They thanked me and informed me that every night after a home football game, there was a dance on campus. Would you like to go tonight to the dance? Now, remember, this is the 50s, and I had just left a sheltered Italian upbringing where dating, and high school didn't mix. All I knew about dating was what I knew from the movies or the popular songs of the day. I, I couldn't remember anything from any of those that described that this exact situation. <laughs> I didn't know what to say to them, so I improvised. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't go with you. They were surprised. Why not? Well, I just met you. I don't know you. Whereupon they pulled out their wallets, <laughs> took out their IDs. I checked the faces matched. Matt, Bob, they were sophomores, roommates in Elliott House. Now, will you go to the dance with us? Well, no, I, I, I just met you. I still don't know you. And then they asked the question that threw me. When will you know us? <laughs> now, I know you don't know somebody just when you meet them, but I've never considered how long does it take to go from meeting to know. I improvised. I'll know you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I noticed that the tall one named Bob was looking at me in a way that was very strange, but nice. The next Tuesday, they called for a date the following Saturday. But since there was no home football game that day, hence no campus dance, would I like to go with them 
to the totem pole ballroom in Norumbega Park. Well, now that I knew them, I said yes. <laughs> Although, at that moment, I had no idea how it worked with two of them and one of me. That's when Bob informed me that since I'd be going with Matt, would I get him a date? When I asked Briggsy, the girl at the front desk, to make up our foursome, I was so brazen. I even told her that I was more interested in the one I had fixed her up with. She said, no problem. It'll be great just to see the famous totem pole ballroom. And the totem pole was something to see. Gleaming, enormous dance floor, giant full-length mirrors wall to wall um, on one whole side of the ballroom. Dazzling colors, spots danced everywhere, reflections from shining mirrored chandeliers. <sighs> Along the ballroom, there were tiers of booths, high-backed, semicircular, intimate booths where we sat on dark, plush, velvety cushions. There was a dim lantern on the little table in front of us where we could have as many soft drinks, Cokes and ginger ales as we liked because only soft drinks were served at the fashionable totem pole. Just about every famous swing band had played there at one time or another. Artie Shaw, Tommy, Jimmy Dorsey, Harry James, Benny Goodman. But on this night, Boston's own Bob Batchelder was there with his swing band. And when Bob Batchelder gave the downbeat, the music swelled. You sigh, the song begins, you speak, and I hear violins. It's <gasps> the totem pole was magic. I danced with Matt, Briggsy danced with Bob, but the whole evening I waited for just one thing. It was the custom in those days that on a double date, you exchanged partners for one dance. When the moment came and Bob walked toward me with that same look, strange but nice, take my hand, I'm a stranger in paradise. And then it was, shall we dance? On a bright cloud of music, shall we? And we were flying across that ballroom floor. And then it happened. He squeezed my hand. <laughs> you do something to me. I didn't want this dance to end. I just, another squeeze. I think he likes me. Why am I on a date with his roommate? <laughs> I didn't want this dance to ever end. I thought perhaps if I could see an image of the two of us each in each other's arms as we glided by that mirrored wall, I'd be able to capture this moment forever. But he was tall and I could hardly see anything. <laughs> if I looked straight ahead, there was his tie, <laughs> two inches below the knot. If I looked to the left, there was his raised arm and shoulder. If I looked to the right, I tried to look over and above our clasped hands, but, but every time I was just about to get a real glimpse, he pivoted away from the mirror. <coughs> and then, before I knew it, the dance was over. Too soon, darling, too soon, like ships adrift, we're swept apart, too soon. I remember nothing about the rest of that evening except that midnight came and the magic was gone. The next week, Matt called for another date. I tried my best to say thank you, but it would be misleading for me to accept another date. That's when Bob got on the phone and began to convince me to go out with Matt again. I don't understand, I said, why do you want me to go out with Matt? So I can see you. I have to go out with your roommate for you to see me. And as the brazen hussy I had become, I said, 
Speak for yourself, John <laughs> The next week after that, it was Bob who called me. I would answer the phone, my heart pounding, my voice trembling, a tune wafting in the air. So please forgive this helpless haze I'm in. I lied and told him I was breathless because the only phone on the dormitory floor was way down at the end of the hall and I had to run the whole way to get it. <sighs> Something was happening to me. I kept tossing in my sleep at night and what's more, I've lost my appetite. <laughs> Stars that used to twinkle in the sky are twinkling in my eyes, I wonder why. Well, it's a good thing Ethel Merman was around at the time. You don't need analyzing. <laughs> it is not so surprising that you feel very strange, but nice. Your heart goes pitta patta. I know just what's the matter. You're not sick, you're just in love. Oh, sweet mystery of life, at last I found thee. I was in love. And after that, whenever they asked me how I knew my true love was true, when your heart's on fire, you must realize smoke gets in your eyes. And so, the budding dance of our relationship fox trotted on. But no movie or song of the time prepared me for when the smoke that gets in your eyes begins to clear. <laughs> they say if two people see each other every day, it takes about three months. <laughs> If they see each other less often, it takes about a year. That's, one, that's when, through the vanishing haze, they look at each other and wonder, who are you really? Was this a case of falling in love with love? Is falling for make-believe? How is this going to work? Bob and I were so opposite. Two different worlds. We lived in two different worlds. He lived in the world of tall. I live in short. You don't even see the same things. He's Yankee. I'm Italian. His family came to this country in 1630 like this. Mine came in 1910 like this. He's the quiet introvert type. I'm not. When he first came to my family, my extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, everybody talking at the same time, totally normal. We were in the middle of a, a passionate conversation, very engaged. Bob stood up, left the room, went up to one of the bedrooms. Everybody stopped talking. What's the matter with him? I don't know. I ran up. Bob, what's the matter? It's too loud down there. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> In my family, food was abundant, lovingly prepared. I mean, if you emptied your plate, that was a signal to my mother to keep putting more food, more food. I mean, food was the glue that holds everything together. It's the center of everything essential. In Bob's family, food was apportioned, functional, solely there for the survival of the species. <laughs> we went to dinner and I saw this small dish of peas come out and I said, oh, we're each getting our individual dish of peas. <laughs> Same dish got passed around. What, eight peas per person? <laughs> I was happy sitting down at a nice meal with friends. Bob was happy eating all by himself, standing up <laughs> straight out of a can. <laughs> I asked him one day, 
Bob, are you hungry? No, I ate yesterday. <laughs> Is this normal? I went to my dad with a list of all the ways that our relationship was working, but all the ways that Bob was not being what I had been promised, that someday my prince will come. My dad said, well, what do you want? You want somebody to step out of the page of your fairy tale and be exactly what you want him to be? You mean that's not going to happen, Dad? <laughs> so since that wasn't going to happen, I married Bob. <laughs> but that didn't mean I didn't stop trying and trying and trying to model him into my fairy tale. I'd say things like, oh, Bob, why don't you talk to me more? Subtext, if you really truly loved me like my prince, you'd talk to me more. What do you want me to talk about? <laughs> well, I don't know, whatever you're thinking about. But I'm not thinking about anything. <laughs> and I think, how is it possible not to be thinking about something? Another one. Bob, if you really, truly loved me like my prince, we'd connect all the time. We'd, we'd merge. We'd become one. We'd be like two onions and keep peeling the layers off each other until our molten cores would be compelled to meld. I was so into becoming one with him that whenever he exercised, I felt better. <laughs> but for him it was, if you really truly loved me, you'd get out of my head. You'd give me some space. I remember one Sunday at the end of the day, he came to me and said, honey, what a wonderful day we just spent together. He spent all of it in the garage, all by himself, puttering alone. <laughs> I'd spent the whole day all by myself puttering inside the house. That's when I realized, for him, we're connected, even if we're 500 feet apart. Never mind talking to each other. We don't even have to see each other. I can't begin to tell you the many, many ways we played that game if you really, truly loved me. I mean, the big things, but even little things, like if you really, truly loved me, you'd remember not to put the plastic containers that crumple on the bottom rack of the dishwasher. You'd remember not to try to get dandelions, the dandelions on the lawn, by using a sledgehammer. <laughs> whack, whack, clumps of dirt, sometimes with a dandelion attached, sometimes not, <laughs> fly through the air. And on the lawn, hold, hold. I was getting nowhere. I think the fairy tale has it backwards. How much easier would my life have been if the fairy tale was about the girl who kissed the frog? The, no, the girl who kissed the prince who turned into the frog so they could live happily after ever. Oh, I remember in those days I would look at him and I would see not the prince of my dream, but I would be thinking, frog. <laughs> Maybe that would have been the better way to have the tail end. When I finally got how futile it was to fashion a perfect prince, I turned my attention to what I at least had a shot at fashioning, this perfect princess. But all the time, Bob and I stayed on that ballroom floor, even when we were way out of step with each other. We were surprised when we began to notice that some of our annoying differences had become gifts for each other. You know that talking about nothing I tried to change in him? Well, after a lot of relaxation techniques and much meditation practice, I've happily learned to do what comes so natural for him thinking about nothing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and all that talking and, and merging, guess who's talking less and wanting more space? 
and who's talking more and wanting less space. Now Bob can't be more than two feet away from me, and he never stops asking me questions, to which I often reply, please, I can't take it anymore. Go to the garage. <laughs> <coughs> then there was the day I remember walking into the living room, and there was Bob sitting quietly absorbed in reading a book. I was put out. He must have done something that my true prince never would have done. He didn't look right. He looked wrong. I left the room for a bit, came back. But this time, he looked good to me. He looked right. He hadn't moved. He was still sitting in the same chair, reading the same book. But now I saw neither a perfect prince nor a flawed fraud, but a flesh and blood human being like me doing the best he could. A warmth filled my body. Smoke cleared from my eyes and, and, and there was love. Nothing had changed except me. What I was thinking, the place inside me from which I was looking. We're married 57 years now. And yes, it's a long, long while from May to December. And the days grow short when you reach September. But we're still on that ballroom floor dancing, sometimes together, sometimes apart, sometimes to different tunes. And when we step on each other's toes, and we still do, more and more we remember to laugh and to dance in each other's shoes. Yeah. Oh, the days dwindle down to a precious few. September, November, and these few precious days I'll spend with you. These precious days I'll spend with you. When powerful, low-calibrating emotions begin to dominate our psyche, they quickly color all of our perspectives. If we are in a place of anger, even the slightest offense will shake our peace. If, we, if resentment drives our thoughts, we collect all the injustices we see as personal attacks. When we are fearful, we are paralyzed into inaction. It's important to see these dominating emotions as teachers, as a medium to work with. The act of creation releases a pure intention. Getting lost in an art form, any art form, allows our source to flow through us. The potter can look at a lump of seemingly formless and greasy clay as a beautiful mug. She throws the clay onto the spinning wheel and through the flow of creation and the inspiration of source, a piece of art appears. When she is in the flow of creation, the clay is worked and encouraged to become what she sees. Why not see the seemingly negative and destructive force of lower emotions as the seeds of contentment and knowledge? Like the potter, we must work with the emotions and encourage it to reveal for us our lessons. Each negative emotion has its opposite, life draining or life giving. Choose to transform your challenges into supports. It takes work. Sometimes you need to stare at that lump of clay for a long time before you can see what it needs to be to serve your path. Sometimes you begin the work and need to start over. That's okay. Find the flow. Create a piece of pottery to serve you, and once you like what you have created, fire it in the kiln of faith. By listening to your source, you know that the creation will in fact serve you. Make it a part of your life, like that favorite mug you use each day. The clay of anger, resentment, and fear were stuck to my hands. I looked at them, knowing they were given to me as teachers. I centered them on the wheel. The wheel began to turn. I wet my hands with the sweat of my conviction. I pressed into fear, and I teased out the form of courage. I muscled into anger. I manipulated it into peace. I clasped my hands around resentment, and I formed it into acceptance. 
Each turn of the wheel brings change. Each turn of the wheel created form. As I worked this clay, it took its shape. I fired my vase in the kiln of faith, an earthen vase to hold my peace, to pour forth my courage, to share my acceptance. I fill my vase from the spring of grace where doubt and confusion find no place. And when it's empty, I fill it once more, pouring forth God's love, the essence of my core. Thank you. At the Robert Burns birthday dinner, I learned to drink scotch the way some Scots do. A drizzle of scotch and a drip of water. Sipped slowly and held sensually over cordial conversation. And so today, I poured myself a drizzle and a drip, sniffed and sipped, watching the downy woodpecker feed on suet in the apple tree, while I pecked at roasted cabbage, carrots, and parsnip on a bed of lentils, sitting in my snowbound sunroom, surrounded by drifts, marooned at home in my own cordial company. Drizzle, drip, lunch in the sun, the blizzard of 2015.